Well, good morning to Massachusetts gaming enthusiasts and Massachusetts gaming skeptics alike, and I want to thank the Massachusetts Gaming Commissioners uh, for the invitation today. Uh, uh, I'm Marty Romidian. I currently work at the University of Massachusetts Donahue Institute, uh, which is a job that uh, primi primarily works uh, to study and enhance the state's economy and uh, in particular to look at the nature of a number of high-tech businesses around the state, but that's not what I'm here for today. I'm here because I what I did previously to coming out to Massachusetts, which is I directed a division of a state agency with, for the state of Missouri uh, that evaluated all of the state's investments and tax incentive programs, and which included uh, an evaluation of casino gaming licenses to be awarded in the state. And so I'm here to share a little bit of that experience with you and, and lessons that we learned in terms of economic research and analysis. Uh, ultimately, uh, the perspective working within the state and for the State Gaming Commission in that capacity uh, brings a different perspective about uh, the casino and gaming industry. Uh, we've heard a lot of talk in the first panel, and it's true, it is an industry, uh, it is a business. They are entertainment venues, uh, but in many ways what they are is very well-lit tax collection stations. And from a state perspective, the gaming commissioner uh, operates very much like fund managers, and it's the same way in the legislation out here in Missouri. At the time, uh, it was very important because 19% of the tax, which was a 21% tax on adjusted uh, gross receipts, 19% of that went to an education fund. And so it went to the schools. And so as we started this process, uh, uh, that type of collection and the money dedicated to that fund was very important and of primary importance. With that said, uh, I want to just give you a little bit of information about a casino market uh, in Missouri, since uh, many in the audience probably aren't familiar with it. Uh, uh, but you know, Missouri is a similar size population uh, to Massachusetts, so potentially some of the lessons we did here maybe translate well over. Uh, just to give you some idea, uh, gaming passed in 1992 by a statewide referendum. Uh, although it was several years later before the, the first casino, there was, as in the Massachusetts law, a geographic restriction, not by zone, but basically by the outline of the ribbons of the big rivers running through the state. All, all gaming had to be within 1,000 yards of either the Missouri or the Mississippi rivers. The first casinos actually had to be floating vessels, right? So these were little riverboat cruises that went out two hours while you did your slot machine, came back in and docked over time. Uh, basically, those became landlocked and became bigger and bigger. But all along, up until 2008, uh, one of the concerns, and I know there's been many debates back and forth about the impacts, social impacts, uh, Missouri had similar concerns as well. And so all along, since the beginning when it was adopted, there was a $500 loss limit imposed. And so literally, you had cards you registered as you went into the casino and you could lose no more than $500 within a two-hour gaming period, which was considered a cruise period. So, so uh, just as a side note of, of interest, you had an interesting situation for a while where uh, the casinos no longer cruised on the river. They were basically just permanently docked, yet they were required to have a licensed sea captain. And you went in, and there was one side rope and another side rope. And depending on your boarding time, you were directed to the station, but the boat never moved. So, uh, so all along, uh, the industry itself uh, was looking to repeal the loss limit, but the voters in Missouri kept the loss limit up until 2008. In 2008, a statewide referendum came on, which would increase the tax, the casinos would increase the tax on themselves by 2% in exchange for dropping the loss limit and also imposing a maximum of 13 casinos. At the time in Missouri, we had 13 casinos. What then happened, so basically the market was full in terms of uh, legally full. However, we had a casino in St. Louis that basically went, uh, uh, the finances went down the tube and essentially a license became available. And so for the first time, much like the commission's wrestling with, we had a restricted market, only one license to give uh, and a bidding process to undertake. This, uh, so um, I began work, we had a 10 month process and the process uh, was much along the lines of what we're debating here in a public forum was talked about several times amongst the agencies about uh, how do we go about this process because, you know, as we are sitting here today, um, the Massachusetts unemployment rate just dropped to 6%. 
So that's all very good news. Uh, we like to think in Massachusetts uh, we're, we're experiencing at least a modest recovery in the midst of a, a broader recession. However, we very much know uh, that there are struggling areas within the state, and the same was true in Missouri, uh, being hit hard by the recession. And so there was a primacy put on, much like the legislation, uh, the casino license and awarding the casino license and getting a casino up and operating as quickly as possible was really looked at as a job creation engine and something uh, of much urgency to be done. Okay, so with that, uh, the process before, like I said, is, is applicants would come in, the Gaming Commission would review. There was never a single set, open the competition up uh, for one specified time period, evaluate and make one award. And with that, we knew that we would be getting, much like is required here, you have economic impact studies coming in from all of the different applicants saying what type of impact they're going to have on the community. And it was decided that we needed a process to create for the commission an apples to apples comparison so you can look at the economic impact in a more standardized way. And what I have up on the board is, is a look at, at uh, where the casino locations uh, were currently, and then the red is where the three proposed, the actual final three applicants that were evaluated were located. You had one in the Kansas City market, one in the St. Louis, and one down in what's referred to geographically as the Boot Hill of Missouri or Southeast Missouri, a very rural area. So those were the three set amongst the others. And just to give you some indication, uh, we had a three-step for the commissioner's benefit. Uh, we worked out a three-step process. You know, the one thing different about Missouri, obviously, is we had uh, a very long history of an established casino market by the time this, this rolled around. And so we had a lot of available data and we had existing businesses. And because of the power granted through the Gaming Commission to basically request of the industry representatives any data that they needed in order to make good judgments, we were able to do something uh, uh, unprecedented and certainly uh, uh, unique in dealing with economic analysis. And that is we basically um, had existing casinos basically provide us with zip code level gaming data. So we knew where the, the majority of their customers were coming from currently. Uh, we also asked uh, the applicants to provide that and the existing casinos also provided us with sales projections as well as cannibalization or basically the type of competitive market pressure they'd feel if a casino located in their area. So we had a questionnaire. We also did a systematic look at gravity modeling which is a technique to kind of look at uh, market penetration of a new market entrance in a similar business and the impact, and then finally an economic impact analysis. Uh, to make it a little more relevant to Massachusetts and not just stick all the way on Missouri, uh, so for instance, you know, a, a real market, when you're looking at casinos, uh, uh, since I'm in the broader economic development and workforce development field, we, we really look at casinos as local market industries. It's just a matter of how big that local market is. Is it a 30-minute drive time, one hour, or two hour drive time? Uh, and so with local markets, you look at you know, three key factors. If somebody from an Applebee's up to a casino is going to look at a potential site, they're going to look at the appetite for that service. Uh, so for instance, this data shows you uh, the raw number of people in Massachusetts and Connecticut, kind of southern New England, who basically gambled in the last 12 months at a casino, and the red indicates a high concentration. So that gives you some idea where the appetite's at. The second key component of a local market is, uh, when you're looking to set up, is your ability to pay, right? Do the people there uh, have the income to pay for your service or at what level? Uh, so when you drop and actually look specifically at entertainment and recreation spending, so that's the part of the disposable income that's directed to re entertainment, which uh, I think Clyde showed you in the NAICS code, kind of fits several different uh, categories. Uh, this is indexed actually to the U.S. average. So in this case, anything that's deeper orange to red is basically telling you the cities, communities in Massachusetts that spend on entertainment recreation above the national average. So that gives you some idea, or at least somebody looking at plotting casino. But I'll just flip back, back and forth. I'll give you a quick little back and forth, right? So there's a lot of people interested in gambling, and the area changes by where they might uh, have the capacity. And then the last and final is events. You've got a dynamic living market when you plop something down or, or make a huge investment like that. 
Uh, in the case of Missouri, we already had 12 existing casinos that a 13th was going to come into. In the case of New England, you have surrounding state markets uh, with a casino coming into it. Uh, so we had to look at the dynamic market trends and events. And events can be both foreseen and unforeseen. And so back to the Missouri study, one of the first things we did was having the ability of having monthly uh, casino revenues from the Gaming Commission, which is collected, you know, they basically collect the take every day and they report adjusted gross receipts amounts uh, monthly. So we had a long time series from 06 through 10 to look at. And what you basically saw uh, is, you know, this is monthly, but Missouri's market, I'll, I'll, I'll echo this, I'll add my two cents worth, or in this case, my one to two billion dollars worth. Uh, Missouri's casino market uh, is, at the time we did the study, was 1.75 billion. Uh, just hit 1.8 billion this past year. Uh, it's, it's pretty much uh, safe to assume, as I saw the estimates ranging from 1.5 to 2.5 billion. You know, one of the things that the Gaming Commission would have to decide, particularly on their economic studies, is where to peg this top end of the market. You know, how much can the market bear in Massachusetts? Uh, you know, based on Missouri and just kind of, you know, I think, you know, a one to two billion dollar market is, is a more than safe estimate for a state like Massachusetts to say there exists a market. In fact, given, you know, four casinos, it's more likely the case that the four casinos isn't a big enough sponge to soak up all the potential market that exists in Massachusetts. So that allows you to really look at the sites and the casinos uh, themselves in terms of how much of that market you can soak up. So in Missouri, um, essentially we had four casinos in St. Louis, four in Kansas City, and four in what we'll call outstate rural portions. Uh, the St. Louis market, by the time we did the study, had risen to 49% of the adjusted gross receipts were coming out of the St. Louis market. Kansas City, as you can see, was a flat market, but represented about 40%, a steady share, and in the four outstates together combined for 11%. As you see, though, the big thing that happened was in November of 07, St. Louis, which has always trailed Kansas City as a casino market, uh, suddenly rose to be the state's top, top market. And, you know, three things happen that help explain why St. Louis overtook Kansas City as the dominant market. First of all, uh, I have listed, if you see, Lumiere and Smoke Fan. Lumiere was a new casino. Uh, the St. Louis market had really evolved. Uh, the St. Louis market started with midsize casinos, I call them mid-size, uh, the 1,000 to 2,000 uh, gaming positions, uh, to a real casino where, where large casinos, we had casinos converting into very large, adding hotels, uh, a lot more amenities. The Lumiere was the newest uh, coming out in that category. Uh, at the same time, Illinois, now this is a real, I know this came up about the smoke ban, you know, and whether it's going to be a positive or negative, I think that's a real uh, it could be really regional in that terms because to some degree uh, one of the, the greatest explanations for St. Louis rise in market growth may have nothing to do with the wisdom of the Gaming Commission or the state of Missouri. It may have literally had to do with Illinois basically imposed a smoking ban across the state and they included their casinos in it. And uh, immediately you started to see because right then there was two casinos right across the river that you could see from the arch in St. Louis. Uh, that basically um, you could start seeing the customers flocking over. Basically, it was a, and so in, in Missouri, the, the idea that you could smoke on the Missouri side and not smoke on the Illinois side uh, created what we estimated about a 9% transfer of, of gaming funds uh, across the river to the benefit of the state when you're looking at that. In addition, the Lumiere, a large new casino, opened on what's called the Cleeds Landing, which is adjacent to the St. Louis Arch, so it became kind of a part of the entertainment uh, area. All three, because there's three casinos down there at the time. Move forward, um, 2008, you have the loss limit repeal, so now you can gamble more than the 500. You have no limit on the loss limit. And you have River City right as we were, just before we started the study, open up again another huge casino uh, down in St. Louis. So you saw the, the St. Louis market changing and evolving. On the other hand, there was something going on in Kansas City because we had to evaluate that because there's an applicant on the Kansas City side as well. Uh, that applicant, um, was facing a different road. Kansas City was turning against, I guess, Missouri uh, revenue or, or potentially detrimental Missouri revenue was uh, the Kansas Speedway. One of the greatest economic development blunders perhaps for the state of Missouri is that NASCAR wanted to build the racetrack on the Missouri side at the time 
uh, basically the state uh, didn't want uh, or didn't, I guess, follow up on that. It ended up being built on the Kansas side. It's now the Kansas Speedway. Huge development going on there. You see the new shopping centers and, and a lot of development. And what they just did, and at the time we're going to do, was open up an enormous casino adjacent to the racetrack on the Kansas side. So what we did is we looked at where the population growth was. And you see that the population growth, when you have a city split by a river, one side's your state, one side's the other state, is we ended up seeing that all the population growth in the metro area was coming from the Kansas side, and most likely that was going to eat into all the existing Missouri casino sides with that legalization. We estimated that to be about a 16% drop. Uh, we also had the existing casinos themselves make estimates. And they weren't making estimates in a room. We had them do it separately. And basically, we, we basically were testing our model against what their estimates were as well. Uh, at the end of the day, we had three applicants. We basically did market area studies with the Gaming Commission uh, we decided uh, it was a decision was made based on research, based on knowledge of the Missouri market, that we were going to set drive time radiuses of 30 miles around the urban areas and 60 miles around the rural areas. And this was informed by the zip code level patron data. Uh, and what we did is we drew those rings around each of the existing casinos. And the idea is where you see a lot of overlap, you're going to have a lot of, of uh, the gaming business competing for the same customers as, as it grows through. With that said, we made estimates that basically reduced the amount because the applicants themselves were saying, OK, we're going to set up a 1,200 uh, gaming position uh, casino. Uh, we expect to make 100 and such million dollars in, in revenues each year. Uh, but what happens in a market, particularly with a market with other entrants, is you don't just get to add that amount. They're just not added on top of each other because uh, you know one gaming patron is going to pick between this casino or this casino because I only have $5 to spend at a table. I'm going to go to this casino or this casino and do it. So there's going to be some displacement of those funds, and, and that was our calculation. And the way the model works and the way the industry uh, works in particular or, or generally is that bigger is better. So you're more likely to go to a bigger casino than a smaller one. You're more likely to go to a closer one than a farther one. Uh, in the case of Massachusetts, one of the key pieces of estimate making the, the market dynamic will be the population growth projections. Here's over the last 10 years uh, population changes within the state, because it's going to be particularly, a, you know, even if you're up to a two-hour drive time distance, you're going to have a majority of Massachusetts uh, and some of that market. Uh, we're going to make part of what I do at the Donahue is run the state census data center. So for instance, uh, for the gaming commissioner's benefit, uh, we'll be doing uh, new updated uh, city level projections this fall. So hopefully that gives you some information on, the, on where we see the, the state population headed by city, town, and also by age breakout, because the 21 plus obviously is a key market. In the end, um, our findings were these, the, the gray on the top are what the applicants submitted uh, in the report for what was going to be developed at the site. Uh, 100, and, and just also not to, uh, take up too much time, but just one piece of, of uh, news after I get done with this. Uh, so we deflated, we, we determined the gravity model about how much the sales were going to be split. We deflated the applicant's estimates, and then we ran the economic impact assessment to give the best idea of which one was really going to create an amount of new uh, gaming revenue that would become part of the funding. Uh, in the end, uh, it turned out that in this case, you know, to some degree, urban areas always have a little bit of advantage. You just have more population, uh, and their construction wages are generally higher, right? So you naturally have a tendency to have a little higher economic return on it by any uh, investment located in an, in an urban area. Uh, but in this case, because of the existing market dynamics, it turned out that the rural area, because it wasn't, it was basically not being penetrated by any other uh, existing gaming establishments in a close proximity uh, turned out to have the best return. And so we concluded the potential for the best amount of money to be collected in terms of funds uh, for the gaming commission in the state. OK. This could all have changed. We had one applicant. Uh, all of them turned out to be mid-size applicants. This, this issue came up. I don't know if you want to save it for questions. I'll bring it up now, because I heard the question about uh, do you license sequentially? Do you, all, do you do them all at once? Do we wait till the best proposal? That, that issue came up during the course 
of what we were doing in our application because you're at the height of the downturn, you came off the financial crisis. Uh, you know, you set up a process where essentially you say, instead of waiting for the proposals to develop and evaluate, you know, what you want to do is you're setting a hard and fast deadline and if you're in the game, get your application and you're in the game and we'll evaluate it on such and such date. So it's everybody interested, get your stuff together and let's, let's look at it. Uh, so that deadline process um, started out, we had about 13 interested applicants who made inquiries. Then you started hearing about uh, some that were going to be several very large ones. Uh, and in fact, all the way up until almost the end, we had a casino that was potentially going to go in St. Louis that was twice the size of what the casino celebration applicant that actually did bid, which would have put it at more along the lines of what Massachusetts was looking for, kind of the half million dollar investment level. And, and you know, quite honestly, the numbers uh, uh, could, could have swung. You know, a bigger casino in that urban area could have still overtaken the smaller casino in a, in, a, in a less dense market. But what really happened is their financing fell through. You know, they couldn't put together the financing, so what you're left with at the end of the day was three mid-size casinos, roughly equivalent in size, and there was a real discussion about whether you, you proceed forward. Uh, but at the same time, the, the need, the urgency, the emphasis on let's get funds in for the education funding, let's get jobs on the ground, it's a good project with a te you know, all the other factors besides the economic impact came into play and so uh, that was part of the decision. Now, one piece that I put into the report that wasn't necessarily uh, a formal part but became a formal part of it is, and from the economic and workforce development perspective, uh, oftentimes a knock on casinos, of course, is you create jobs but low paying jobs. And so, uh, you know, in this case I wanted to show you, you know, that basically they're creating 500 to 600 jobs but you know their actual wage levels, and of course we had data too that showed the existing casino wage levels. You know they were running in Missouri. Now keep this. This is Missouri. So, but the state average wage rate uh, in Missouri, as you can see, we did it by MSA. So you're talking about 30 to 42 thousand is an average wage in Missouri. The casinos were paying below average wage. They would have never qualified for any of our quality jobs program, our targeted programs. But you know, in the context of the economic impact in terms of regional impact, employment impact. Uh, what we did, if you put some context around it, what you found is that the $28,000 wage in that rural Cape Girardeau, Southeast Missouri area is actually 95% of the average wage for the area, 84, 81. It made more of a dent in the regional product, me meaning it was going to be a bigger employer, having more impact, and it was also going to eat into the existing unemployment pool potentially more. So in that relative context, it also had uh, a little bit higher on that standard of quality jobs. So with that, uh, I thank you for, I guess, uh, taking a trip back in time with me for about two years to Missouri, and I hope that information is helpful. Good uh, morning. Um, my name is Steve Norton, and I am the executive director of the New Hampshire Center for Public Policy Studies, and uh, about well, every year for the last 10 years, the state of New Hampshire has engaged in a conversation about whether they're interested in expanding uh, gambling in New Hampshire. And we were asked uh, by the gaming commission that was established by Governor Lynch to help that commission understand some of the questions that the uh, gaming commission in Massachusetts is struggling with um, as they look forward to uh, making some decisions about location. Um, the first thing I'll say is uh, the commission um, faced incredible skepticism about the estimates that were being provided them, both pro and con. General belief was that the estimates of revenue were overinflated and that the estimates of impact were under, or excuse me, were also overinflated. And therefore, we were asked to be extremely skeptical I should say we're not experts in gambling in any way. What we are is experts at collecting and uh, synthesizing information. And we relied basically on the experts like Clyde um, and the innovation group for understanding some of the impacts uh, on the, the revenue side as well as some other national experts on some of the social costs um, question that we dealt with. But basically what the commission asked us to do was answer the question what constitutes a prudent calculation of the net benefit of expanded gaming. And 
Um, that's not exactly the question that you're dealing with, but it has many of the same parts. There are definitely positive impacts, and they include those that are up there, the revenue to the state across a variety of different tax streams in, our, in the state of New Hampshire. There were local revenues associated with the pro property tax and additional fees that are associated with growth and population. There are obviously economic development impacts, short term being construction, and the long term being the new job. of the casino, and uh, there are economic development implications outside of the casino ind industry in many respects, and that to the extent that you bring in new business and uh, new spending. There are also a whole host of negative impacts. Uh, there, in addition to the positive revenue impacts, there were negative uh, cannibalization of our, in essence, our sales tax, which is a, a tax on meals and rooms. The substitution of uh, gambling for lottery expenditures, as discussed before, and you can see the remainder, including measures of social costs, uh, new crime, pathological problem gaming, um, as well as political concerns. These are all very hard to measure and are fundamentally dependent on assumptions that are somewhat imprecise, both on the revenue side and on any uh, estimate of the cost. And so in all the work that, I would, uh, that you're doing, I would suggest that transparency about those estimates and those revenue, those assumptions are really important so that you understand what you're getting when you ask, uh, ask for information. You're clear about what those uh, assumptions are. We, uh, so based on this, in essence, whole set of uh, possible calculations uh, about the positive and negatives associated with uh, gambling, we built a model uh, that was both internally logical and also would be consistent across both the positive and negative impacts of gambling. Our primary assumption was that the placement of gambling facility where one doesn't currently exist is going to increase the gambling behavior of people. That seems strange, but uh, all measures of revenue are based essentially on the fact that you're going to get people to gamble there. Um, the second piece, which is not inconsistent with anything that anyone said to date, is that the farther away you are from a casino, the less likely it is you are going to gamble, or alternatively, the closer you are, the more likely it is that you're going to gamble. And that has a big impact on site selection, um, particularly in an environment where a difference of 60 miles can make a big difference w within your access to uh, both people and, uh, and economic um, spending. The gravity of the facility, as we heard earlier, that's the attractiveness, the size, the amenities, is critically important uh, to both the behavior of gambling, but also your ability to attract other economic activities, um, and also has a big impact on the degree to which you're going to be cannibalizing the existing economic activity in a communicate in an area. And the final one, which is based on the really the first two, is that for a small share of the population, everyone agrees that there is a, a, a pathological behavior that is associated um, that has some costs associated with it. Um, that has both uh, potential revenue implications for the state or local community who has to deal with them uh, and also for local communities. Of those, obviously, from the, the debates that you've heard in your own state, the most difficult to estimate are the, the, the social issues down at the bottom. But the commission was unwilling to let those go, and so we, uh, as a result, uh, tried to be even more transparent in the assumptions that we made there so that they could make their own determination of things. So basically what we did was we used a drive time analysis. Uh, you've heard a little bit about that here. Uh, adjusting for 30, 60, and 90 minute drive times and adjusting for various parts in the state for tourism as well as some other characteristics of the uh, New Hampshire experience. Uh, and we also simulated the impact of other states' activities. So our model, what we did is we took as inputs the location uh, identified by the commission, the size, that's the amenities, a, a proxy for the amenities, the type, and that is whether it was a, a slots parlor or whether it had table games, and other action uh, by state, that included Maine as well as Massachusetts in our, our model. And we produced as outputs the economic, revenue, crime, and other social costs to the state. Now, in any net true cost-benefit analysis, we would have included a whole bunch of other estimates, but we didn't because we were really asking the question, what's the net benefit to the state? If we had been asking about local communities, we would have uh, uh, asked questions about local infrastructure, and you heard uh, Michael Pollack talk a little bit about that, the implications for rural schools, infrastructure, and the like, as well as the implication for local revenue and the property tax, which I think would be um, one of the things that you'd want to look at uh, in your model. And then we put it all together. Um, we began with that market definition 
and we said there are going to be economic impacts and there's going to be an impact associated with the gambling behavior. Uh, we estimated the number of gamblers and the intensity, which uh, you've heard a lot about. Estimates of pathological new gambling dollar, dollars and came up with a net impact amount for each of these uh, communities. And then uh, on the economic development side, we used uh, sort of a two path, one estimating short term and long term, and then direct and indirect costs associated with each. Estimated the degree to which that economic activity would cannibalize existing activity and came up with a net impact. And that was put together for the commissioner for each of the sites that they identified. And then we tested it. Uh, how well did our, our models measure up against what the experience was in some of the other middle Atlantic states? And they were uh, remarkably close in our ability to predict revenues, uh, economic development, uh, both the RIMS and REMI models, which you don't need to know the acronyms for them, estimated economic development costs, uh, benefits that were too high relative to the experience. And the social costs, it's very difficult, frankly, to estimate what the the, um, how well we, we measure because the, the, the measurement of it is very difficult. And finally, we had a peer review of our report. So that's the model that we, we developed. And I'm glad to talk specifically about characteristics of that and the things that we measured. It's, uh, we have a report which documents it um, very well. But I thought I'd just throw out just a couple of observations that I had looking at the map that you're looking at with our model in mind. Um, you'll note that if I go back up to this, we looked at markets at 30 and 60 and 90 minute travel times, believing that fewer people would come to a, a place more than 90 minutes. And that's a slightly different assumption than you've made in most of the economic analyses have made, that there's a resort component to this, that their two hours drive time is probably where you're going to get most, but you're going to bring in people outside of the existing environment. And I wonder if in that world in which you've got three regions and you have multiple uh, casinos in each, the degree of overlap that you have in those markets. And this is uh, a map showing 30, 60, and 90 minute drive times with the placement of random uh, within the three different regions, but places that people have talked about. And you can see that there's pretty considerable overlap across those communities. And so I think one of the challenges that the, the market is going to have and also you're going to have in your thinking about what information to correct collect is to get at the degree to which that overlap exists or does not. And I wish that I had an easy answer for you, but I don't. But I suspect that there are experts in the gambling industry that would be able to help you understand that more clearly than we. In our model, um, there would be, you know, the green is the place where you get a lion's share of a, a local casino's uh, um, activity. And in that model, the placement of uh, the casinos would be best from an economic and revenue generation perspective in north of Boston and in an, a corridor down in the southeastern uh, part of Massachusetts. Because if you remember the maps that, um, I'm sorry, I've forgotten your name, just put up, that's where a lot of the revenue is and that's where a lot of the gambling behavior is. Um, but that might not be the right place because those are also potentially competing with enormous economic development activities in the Boston area and also very significant gambling uh, behavior in uh, Connecticut with Mohegan Sun and, um, and Foxwoods. So uh, in the context of the work, you're asking a similar set of questions. Here are the inputs that you're taking, um, the outputs that you're interested in, and the, the markets that you're really trying to understand are that. And how and in what ways um, can you encourage either in the application process to get the information that you need that's going to be able to answer those questions about economic value. Um, you know, this may be uh, the beginning of a roadmap, this particular question of um, cost and benefit estimation, but certainly isn't comprehensive. So I'll end there. And do you have slides or no? No? OK. Hello, my name is Doug Walker. I'm an economist at the uh, College of Charleston. And uh, I do not have slides, which one disadvantage of that is that everyone's going to be focused on me speaking instead of on the slides. But uh, I'll deal with that. 
So what I thought I'd do today is talk about um, different aspects of legalized gambling that I've done research on uh, and kind of go through some of those findings relatively briefly, uh, point out some things that I think are, are current questions that I'm looking at that I think are interesting, and then end with some issues that I think would be uh, perhaps of particular interest to, to Massachusetts as uh, it begins uh, introducing casinos here. Um, I would like to say that I've, I've found the all of the panelists so far to be very interesting. And as a public forum, I think this is uh, very good information that, that people are able to see these different perspectives on this, as well as the uh, commission uh, asking questions. Um, I, I, I tend to agree with almost everything I've heard that these are key issues, and so I'm happy to uh, be a part of this. Um, so one thing that I think I do that's different from most of the other people that have uh, been panelists is that as most of my work is geared at getting into academic journals. Uh, as such, what, we, what I tend to do is look at past data, try to model what's going on, the relationships between various variables, and then get it through a peer review process, which can be good and bad. It can be good in the sense that other people are reading the work and making sure that it has some merit, but it can also be bad because you often wonder have these people even read the paper that they're giving me comments on and rejecting the paper for? Uh, but that's the academics and that's the way it goes. But what I don't do is a lot of prediction of values of what revenues might be uh, in various scenarios. And that's what a lot of these other people uh, have an expertise in doing. And so I think it's good to get uh, different perspectives on those things. Um, so things that I've looked at that I think are interesting and relevant to Massachusetts include the economic growth effects of casinos, which uh, I've looked at at a state level. Uh, I think, um, and what we do has been to aggregate data for all of the states in the U.S. that have introduced casinos, look at the relationship between casino revenues and economic growth, uh, which we define as per capita income, and we found a positive relationship in general. Now, I've done two or three different renditions of this study but uh, I think that there's pretty good evidence that, that casinos tend to promote economic uh, growth or development in the state. Um, and so that's one thing that I think is important. I think that uh, Massachusetts, when it goes into uh, introducing casinos, will probably see a positive impact uh, from that overall. I've looked at how different uh, gambling industries affect each other. So looking at casinos, lottery, uh, horse racing, and dog racing. And uh, that study was published in 2008, so the, the data were relatively old. But again, looking back at states that had multiple industries, um, the most interesting results that I've found have been that casinos and lotteries tend to be uh, substitutes or competing with each other. Uh, and so that you would likely see some decrease uh, in lottery expenditures in Massachusetts. Now, as was mentioned on the first panel, that may be just a temporary thing, uh, and I would echo the, the uh, comments by Mike Pollock earlier that if it's marketed right, it, it could potentially be complementary with the lottery. And I should mention I've, I've worked with Spectrum on, on the 2008 Massachusetts uh, report and also recently on the lottery issue, and that's something that's, I know, important is to what extent will the casinos affect the lottery. Historically, I think that, that there's been a, uh, substitute relationship between those two industries. Uh, one issue that I spent a lot of time, not so much recently, but in the earlier days when I was doing research in this area was on the social cost of gambling, which has been, uh, especially back in the early 90s when casinos were first being introduced uh, in states with rivers and riverboat casinos, social cost issues, which um, has been a particularly difficult uh, issue to study. And there's a variety of reasons for that. One is, Different people from different backgrounds have a different perspective on what it is to be a social cost. What is the definition of it? Uh, and then, as this was, was just mentioned, the measurement of those is extremely difficult for a variety of reasons. And so I've spent uh, quite a bit of effort uh, looking at studies that have been produced that estimate the social costs. Uh, and I think that's probably one of the most complicated parts of the whole uh, equation with casinos. Um, <clears throat> A few other issues that I've looked at that are not so relevant now. One is the motivation for legalizing casinos. Massachusetts already has, so uh, you probably don't care about that. But unsurprisingly, fiscal stress ends up being one of the uh, more common and stronger predictors of whether a state will introduce uh, casinos. And so since 
although legalized gambling in general actually doesn't provide a large proportion of most states' revenues, um, I think in Massachusetts it's about seven per, uh, they rank about seventh among states in terms of the proportion of overall revenues that come from gambling. Uh, but for most states, it's far, far under 5% of total revenues come from gambling of, of all sources added together. So it's actually not a huge proportion of uh, most states' um, revenue side of the budget equation. Um, I've done a little bit of work, and, and it was mentioned in the first panel on how does uh, legalized gambling or casinos in, in particular affect property values. And I think that is a very good question. Uh, which there has been a, there have been a few studies in academics on that, and I'm, I'm not very familiar with um, whether in the consulting world whether there's been a lot of work in that. But there have been a few studies that have looked at casinos and the effects on uh, residential values and uh, commercial property values. And I, I did a study on that on Detroit, um, which has a few uh, casinos in the downtown area. And what we found in that study looking at sales data of commercial properties were a few segments of the economy where uh, sales price data indicated that there was actually increases in values as a result of the casinos. Those industries that were positively affected were, I think, more related to tourists coming in. Uh, but one interesting thing was we found no negative effect on any uh, segment of the commercial real estate industry as a result of the casinos. Now one potential problem is, and I haven't been to Detroit, but I think property values aren't doing very well there in general, and so if you're already at or near zero, how much down could it go from there? I'm not sure. So there may be other issues going on in, in Detroit that uh, help explain that, that any economic development might be good there. Uh, so this, that's an overview of some of the things that I've done in the past. Um, a few issues that I think are important that, that uh, I'm trying to look at now, and I think other people are too, uh, is the question of to what extent are casino taxes regressive in nature. It's pretty well taken for granted that casino taxes are regressive because there's been a lot of literature suggesting that lotteries are. And I believe that literature, but I'm not so convinced that the same is true of casinos. And there's some technical arguments in economics of where the, the actual tax burden falls that has not been explored in uh, casinos that, that I think need to be. And so I'm trying to look at that now. And I think that's an, an interesting and important question. And then the other issue, which, uh, and it may just be that I'm completely uninformed on this, and I would certainly de defer to the, uh, the people that have done the economic impact studies and then the industry itself. But it's not obvious to me whether a regional model, which Massachusetts has adopted, where you have three regions, there'll be a casino in each, the same has been followed by Kansas, Ohio, uh, and others. But it's not obvious to me that that model is superior or inferior to one where casinos are clustered or whether there's some agglomeration. Uh, it seems to me that if you're trying to attract tourists, one of the things about Las Vegas that is, is interesting is that there's a bunch of casinos there together. Of course, they compete with each other. But the fact that people have a bunch of different opportunities different casinos, each with different amenities, which I would echo earlier comments that those are important. That also will attract people just because they have more options, I think. Um, but I guess the model is established here, so that may not be as, as relevant for you now as it, it might have been before uh, the legislation was passed. And then a related question, which I'm working on, and um, I'm kind of doing some work similar on Missouri, which uh, looks at how does the proximity of casinos to each other and their size affect each other? And it's also not obvious to me that, that although I recognize casinos are going to compete with each other, I think that agglomeration effect where having a few different places near each other might attract more people into that neighborhood or into that uh, region. Uh, and so I think there's two offsetting effects. And our, our early results in Missouri suggest that those two effects are both real and perhaps of uh, similar size. Uh, and then the other issue that I'm, I'm currently studying is uh, casinos and uh, political corruption, which is kind of an interesting uh, study. We haven't gotten very far with that, but we're kind of in the early stages. But overall, I would emphasize that something that others have said is that I think that all of these effects, whatever you happen to be interested in, are probably very market specific. And so one of the, the things in, in studies that I've done where we find results, um, where we aggregate a bunch of states together, you often will find some states that have 
one impact, other states have other uh, impacts. And so I think it is probably very uh, state or region specific. So I think that's an important point that should be emphasized. And then a few other uh, just thoughts of, of things that maybe uh, the commission and the, and the voters should be thinking about as casinos are uh, introduced here. On the question of licensing, uh, I would agree again with uh, Mike Pollock on his, his point about the, the fact that that's going to affect the capital, uh, the size of the capital investment likely. And so that is an important question, what, what type of fee uh, should be charged. And then the sequential, whether it should be sequential or not, also I think is an interesting question that should be addressed. As an economist, an interesting question to me, and I have not thought through this, so I'm not sure it's a good idea, but the idea of auctioning off the license uh, as a part of the proposal might be interesting to see what the, the companies themselves think that the license is worth. That would be a signal uh, to the state as to what the companies think the license is worth. Um, <clears throat> Someone already had mentioned this, but how casinos affect residential uh, commercial property values and uh, especially non-gambling businesses. That's, I know, a concern for existing businesses always voice that issue, will, will casinos uh, harm them? And there's been no good studies in academics that have addressed that issue that I've seen. And so I think that is a key issue also. Uh, the, the large destination resort versus a smaller casino model, which one of those is best for uh, Massachusetts? I think others have addressed that, the extent to which each can attract tourists and which will be more likely to keep people at home. I think that's a key question uh, that should be studied. Uh, the market saturation question uh, is, is another issue. Uh, Clyde mentioned that in his uh, uh, remarks also among others, and I think that our evidence from our study of Missouri suggests that Missouri hasn't reached that point uh, yet, and, uh, but I think, again, each region might, might be different. It really depends on the public, who's, who's uh, the customers at various casinos. Uh, the online gambling issue, I think that's going to be, I think, everywhere in the U.S. pretty soon. I don't know whether that's going to affect traditional casinos or not, I think that's an important question. Um, my guess would be that it, it would not be that damaging to the traditional casinos, but I have no real idea. That's a new thing. Uh, and the one thing that maybe as a political matter is completely irrelevant, but one thing that always surprises me in discussions, either in academics or in policy uh, reports, is that rarely is the benefits that consumers get from the opportunity to gamble listed at all as a benefit of legalizing casinos. And one of the benefits, surely, is that people like a new opportunity uh, for entertainment. And it's Clyde mentioned that it is an, an entertainment option. And so, as with any other type of industry or firm, a new firm in an area, from the consumer's perspective, is typically going to be beneficial. It gives them a new opportunity, a new option, and when there's more competition, it uh, tends to bring prices down, and consumers also benefit from variety. So I think from the consumer's perspective, it, it can also be seen as good, even if they're not coming from out of state. Uh, although, obviously, you have to understand that the people that have to compete with that existing businesses uh, tend to prefer not to have more competition. And so that's a, an issue that I don't know how easy it is to measure that empirically, but I think it's relevant. <coughs> And then one other, uh, I have two other points. One is that perhaps as you're seeking additional information, uh, it would be useful to have people read through various reports and offer with the intent of getting critical feedback on those reports. Uh, a few people have mentioned the assumptions that are used are important and getting some other perspective on, okay, what are the key assumptions here? How likely are they to hold? I think that's good information to use in developing public policy. But, all this research by its nature has to rely on assumptions. I think it's just uh, useful uh, to be aware of what they are. And then lastly, uh, I don't know how relevant this is, but both with lotteries and then increasingly with casinos, uh, the suggestion that the revenues, a portion of the revenues are going to be devoted to education. That's always a good thing because people like to, to give money to education. One interesting question that people have studied in the lottery is, when, let's suppose the lottery is going to give a million dollars to education. Well, that doesn't necessarily mean that the legislature doesn't then reduce 
their funding of education by a million dollars. So it would be interesting to keep track of does net spending on education increase as a result of the casino's <coughs> excuse me, contribution to it. And that's an issue that I don't think has been addressed with uh, casinos. I know it has with lotteries. Anyway, those are a few of the comments that I had for suggestions for what would be interesting to uh, look at. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for those excellent presentations. I think now we go to the questions from the commission. I'll start off, and uh, I think on behalf of everybody on the commission, first of all, thank you for your participation. And secondly, Professor Walker, we hope we don't become part of your corruption um, studies at any point. Um, a quick question for um, t -t 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 Professor Ramiti. Um, customer data. Uh, what types of customer data do casinos usually collect? How willing in Missouri were they able to share that with you? Uh, and what pieces of it did you find valuable? Uh, what we, we had, uh, the Gaming Commission, of course, had authority to basically regulate the existing casinos and those who would be applicants. Uh, and so they had, we, in our discussions, we talked about the ideal information that we would have. And of course, this is business intelligence, right? So uh, it, we wanted to know uh, zip code level patron data. We basically wanted to know uh, what percentage of customers were uh, attending the existing casinos based on zip code. They keep that data by their own intelligence, be it, for instance, rewards cards, other, other means, okay. In order to get that data, first of all, it was the commission um, that worked it out. We signed the confidentiality because it wasn't to be shared. We wanted it aggregated, not by individual. Uh, but as I'm trying to point out, that was critical because then you're able to get a little more real and tangible information on is it really, you know, we decided it was a 30-mile drive time market for the urban areas based on that data, not just randomly 30, 60. Now, we were looking at where the preponderance of, of their market was, and these are local market businesses. Um, and it was interesting in some cases because you would hear some of the casino applicants, for example. So you had an existing casino market that you could uh, tap into, and of course they had a perspective, right? They, they were leery of having any new casino near where they're at, so they had kind of a uh, perspective like we're worried where these things are going to be sited at. We had new applicants that were talking about all the benefits of their site, and so we, we heard a lot about uh, interstate intercept, which is basically, you know, get close to a major thoroughfare, you got a lot of traffic and cars, uh, you got cars coming from out of state on interstates, and all of a sudden they're going to see your sign, your nice casino in the distance, they're going to pull off and gamble, the interstate intercept. We had several casinos in the state that were well positioned along the interstate, but what you found out with this more nuance, we've talked about there are nuances to every market. We actually found uh, one casino that was right along the interstate, but it did much more of its business, the majority of its business north-south, meaning it was basically not getting it off the interstate, it was getting it into northern Missouri and down to the Lake of the Ozarks, which is a central Missouri Recreation Lake, which is uh, populated by a lot of seniors, retirees, and, and basically a lot of rural residents. I, I mean, Massachusetts doesn't have uh, any official rural space, but there are a lot of rural areas. Uh, but in Missouri, there's a lot of open space, and what you find out is that many people in Missouri and rural towns don't like to drive to the big city, no matter how big the casino are. They want a convenient, kind of quieter, easier to get to location, and that, and that was being. So we were able to test uh, assumptions like that using that type of data and secure confidentiality through agreements. Um, also, Professor Ramidi, um, you did an interesting analysis on uh, how much revenue you thought would be generated by the three competitors um, and jobs. Did you do any assessing of substitution effect? Did you measure jobs compared to lost jobs? Uh, no, not that directly, you know, the idea of displacement. Uh, we had uh, the casino industry, without a doubt, has been 
uh, I think, uh, widely accepted. I use that phrase, obviously, but, uh, uh, you know, at the time, uh, the market uh, and the jobs now top about 11,000 jobs. Uh, what we did was um, we took the jobs figures supplied by the applicants and we basically deflated them by what we thought were really going to be new additional sales and not just diverted sales from an existing customer going to this casino, going to that casino. So we deflated in that way what we thought the real jobs impact would be given that level and then ran it through the model. So to some degree, like I said, it wasn't direct, but what you're getting is a less, uh, you're getting less of an impact in the total jobs figure than you would if you just accepted the applicant. So I hope that answers it. I wanted to ask uh, uh, Stephen Norton about your approach. Once you, once you got everything together, you said you tested your approach before you began to have confidence that it, it was going to give you the right answers. How, how did you go about testing it? You, you didn't have real data uh, the way pr uh, Professor Ramiti did. So, Well, we, test, we tested different parts of our model. Um, the, we had gaming revenues from all the states, that's generally public information, and we had the characteristics of our model and we could relate our model to those areas to see how well our model predicted revenues. And we were plus or minus 5%. So it said to us, our model is pretty good at predicting uh, how much revenue you can generate in, the, in, in this particular industry. And it, our models weren't terribly inconsistent with anything that the industry has created. Um, so that, was, that made us feel a little bit better. Um, the question about economics, we used tested models. We used REMI and RIMS, which are two economic development uh, assessment tools, and they were close, um, which uh, helped us feel more comfortable with that. The piece that we couldn't test in any way was the social impacts component. It is uh, arguably the weakest part of our analysis, and we basically used an average of what the literature suggested across a variety of different dimensions and said, this is the best we can do under the circumstances. I have a question for uh, Mr. Walker. Uh, you mentioned um, the, the, that you've looked at uh, the effects on property values at a residential and commercial. And um, you, you, you mentioned there was no increase necessarily uh, in some of the commercial properties that were not associated with hospitality, perhaps. And there was uh, an increase in, in, in those others. But I'm curious about this prior idea from the prior panel uh, relative to um, an inventory of the businesses, whether there's uh, a turnover of those businesses, whether property values remain the same. And I'm also interested relative to residential uh, property values that uh, uh, I don't believe you mentioned, so. Yeah, I think both of those are very good questions, which uh, at least in the academic literature, I'm not sure they've been addressed. And so, um, yeah, we did look at, at sales values for commercial property, but as far as I know, there has not been a, a good study that's looked at turnover and types of businesses. Now, I've heard that, and you know, critics will argue that, well, you see all pawn shops turning up around casinos and other <coughs> things that you, you are bad types of businesses, uh, but I don't know if there's been a good study on that. Um, and then residential values, I think, would be a good indicator. Um, there are actually a few studies that I think that hit at that, um, and so, uh, Mike Wentz is an author of one of those, I know. So there's a few studies that have looked at uh, reach, uh, residential property values. Um, but that's, that's something that would be very good, I think, for Massachusetts to try to keep track of and study. If I could respond to the question that was raised earlier about the economic development implications. We found a similar point that there's, it's hard, hard to predict exactly what economic impact you're going to have with gambling. Generally, it's positive. So we moved actually to sports venues to see if there was some literature there that could help us understand the impact. And um, it's also mixed there, that it's not clear one way or the other necessarily that you're generating new. It's generally not negative, but it's not you know, generating large uh, economic development implications. Steve Norton, what was the, what was the bottom line of your research? 
Uh, on your, your cost-benefit analysis? Well, I'll give you three, or uh, we estimated for five sites, and there were two sites where there was a net economic benefit. One was in the ski country, largely due to the tourist effect, that it really was a resort destination point and brought in significant revenue, I mean significant um, discretionary income, and the other was along the Massachusetts-New Hampshire border. Even after netting out the other social costs um, and regulatory costs. Uh, I had a question about the um, about the Missouri bidding process um, and, and, and all of the the details of the process have to do with economics and um, you know what the what the data say um, is, I'm assuming that all of the candidates um, were suitable as far as their business practices. Uh, before this model was it was in place and their financial stability, I know you mentioned one larger um, uh, prospective applicant that I, I think what I heard you say was that they on their own decided not to proceed with a bid. So all of your candidates were um, suitable in any every other way that you could use these steps to determine who got that license? Uh, well, you know, as you do on the commission, you have a, a multitude of criteria you're going to mm -hmm. evaluate. You know, we were we were particularly looking at the one aspect of economic impact, but that mm -hmm. certainly wasn't the the sole criteria. It was a, a very important criteria. What what ended up happening, of course, is that um, Missouri had gone through 13 previous licensing processes, so they had a little bit of benefit of history. But quite honestly. They hadn't licensed uh, a casino in several years since River City, and in, in that time, there was no member of the existing commission that had ever gone through the licensing process. Now, they had staff, and, and of course, uh, on top of this, you had this new dynamic, which was it was going to be this kind of competitive bidding. We want to get it out the door so the construction can begin as soon as possible so we can get the maximum economic impact during a downturn. All of these issues were up. And, and so uh, the process was, was um, kind of running concurrently. So yes, we were meeting early on with the Gaming Commission to set out what is going to be the strategy for the economic impact analysis. And during the course of those conversations, uh, which happened, uh, I think they were early as March of that year, and then the award process was December. So you're talking about within the course of, of the one-year time frame, but we had a pre-meeting to talk about how do we get an apples to apples comparison on economic impact, which was we're going to award two years construction, five years operation. If they're going to build the hotel after uh, five years, we're not going to count it. You know, we just want the immediate. We're going to send out these surveys. In the meantime, they had another group that was working on the financial due diligence. You had the highway patrol working on the, the background checks. Because what they did is they set up a process where they, where they gathered letters of intent or interest to start getting a handle on who the pool might be. They started communicating in, in the ways that they could to kind of, you know, uh, get those. They did the public hearings in the communities over the summer, all before the official applications were due and the 50,000 in the case of Missouri was due by the applicant to have the review. So I think there was a lot of upfront work, continuous work before, you know, uh, uh, actual applicant had to put money on the table. And during the course of this, one of those that looked very promising had to back out because they had a large in institutional investor who basically was caught up in the financial crisis and they couldn't bring the money to bear. So, just just wanted to call the attention that we are 30 minutes past our official end time. So. Luckily, luckily we're the audience as well. So, um, uh, Dr. Walker, uh, you said you'd done some research on social costs of gambling. Can you tell us anything interesting? What did you what What have you learned? Any quantification? Yeah, what I've uh, done is mostly review other studies that have been done in the past. And I think the, the reason why it becomes so difficult to estimate those is that um, most of the social costs that people will agree these are social costs of a gambling, most of those are attributable to problem gamblers. And so psychologists can do pretty well uh, in estimating the prevalence of problem gambling and all of that, but when it comes to trying to develop a monetary estimate of the social costs, there's a few problems that get in the way of that. One is uh, just a definitional issue, what do you mean by social cost? 
Well, it can't be just anything that government spends money on in the sense that if, okay, if we increase spending on education, well, that's probably a good thing, but social cost implies it's a bad thing. So there's a few definitional issues, whether transfers of wealth should be included in that or not. And so, but aside from that, I think the, the, the biggest problem with it is that uh, for a lot of problem gamblers, I think the psychology research shows uh, over half of those people also have other issues. So they might have alcohol or drug use problems. And so it, I think it's impossible to kind of partition whatever, even if you could evaluate the cost, how do you partition that across the different problems the person may have? And so for that reason, I've argued that trying to come up with a monetary estimate is probably not very fruitful. It might be better to focus more on, okay, here's the problems that these types of of, uh, that these people have and here's the types of uh, problematic behaviors that they have and be aware of that rather than trying to focus so much on a dollar value for it. And so it's, it's not to deny that there are social costs but rather to say that what might seem like a very precise and well thought out estimate uh, actually is based on a large number of somewhat arbitrary assumptions. And you know all of this stuff rests on assumptions to some extent but the ones dealing with social costs are partic particularly problematic I think. Thank you. Um, also, you um, talked about having done a fair amount of research, I think, on the extent to which casinos and lotteries compete for the same dollar. You said, and then you said you might well, it might well be right that it comes back, but the, your research was the extent to which they did cannibalize one another. Do you have any data specifically on that? Yeah, well, that was based on, uh, I believe it was 1985 to 2000 data for all states that have uh, casinos and lotteries. And so with the, the statistical analysis we did showed that, that both lotteries harm casinos and casinos harm lotteries. And so that there was a negative relationship. Now we didn't take into it, so this is putting all states together. So it's not look, that doesn't mean that a particular state it might be a different relationship, but overall it was a negative relationship between the two. How, did, how much negative did you? That's the question I can't, I can't give you a precise you know, casino spending goes up by a dollar, lottery goes down by whatever. I can't give you a Is that me or what? I guess we're about done. Uh, so th there are other studies that have estimated that, but our study did not get in a precise uh, to what extent they harm each other. Any other questions? Well, uh, I think we have concluded. Clyde remarks. Barrow, right. Thank you. Uh, Martin Ramiti, Doug Walker, Steve Norton, and all our earlier panels and our patient audience. I'm Steve Crosby. I'm the chair of the commission. I want to thank everybody for coming. I hope lots of people saw it online. Um, this is a big, big challenge, and this is incredibly interesting and an important part of it. And uh, we're on our way. Thanks for coming. <laughs>